Greeting from Cleveland and good morning everyone. I would like to thank the organizing committee for the invitation and it is my great pleasure to participate in this important session. Nothing to disclose. Because of the broad nature and the puzzling language of the title, I would like to clarify two key points. First, multivisceral transplantation has many faces that are depicted in this slide liver plus intestine, and full or modified multiviscera. Second, I'm not sure what a well-compensated cirrhosis or hepatic fibrosis means. Unfortunately, there are no current tools that accurately measure the hepatic reserve. The here and histopathologic details are important to guide the care path. I truly believe that surgical wisdom, or what I call surgical homeostasis, is the central core of a successful outcome. We all must remember that patients should always come first. There are few relevant clinical scenarios that will be addressed throughout the talk. This will be delivered with radiologic images and illustrative figures. First, Gastroesophageal varices can be successfully managed with endoscopic ablation in patients with preserved hepatic function and patent portal system. There is usually no need for transplant with liver or multivisceral. With recurrent variceal bleeding, portal hypertensive surgeries, including shunts or gastric devascularization, are indicated. Tips should always be reserved for the high-risk surgical patients. The commonly used shunt procedures are selective, as DSRS, or portosystemic as a small diameter mesocaval shunt. Surgical, mucosal, or neuromuscular irreversible gut failure is commonly associated with compensated cirrhosis or extensive hepatic fibrosis. Gut transplantation with liver-containing allografts is indicated when reconstructive surgery is not technically feasible or fails to restore nutritional autonomy. This is an example of concomitant end-stage global dysmotility that dictates the need for a full multivisceral transplant. Multivisceral transplant is also indicated for patients with Gardner syndrome and large infiltrating mesenteric dysmoid tumors. This is another case of recurrent benign pancreatic mass with portomesenteric thrombosis, biliary structures, and juvenile diabetes. There is no other viable option for this patient except a multivisceral transplant. We all should be aware of the pioneer work of Tom Cato utilizing auto rather than allo transplantation as an alternative approach for abdominal tumors that are not amenable to conventional resection with free margins. Patients with hostile infected abdomen often require a two-stage operation with a multivisceral transplant being a reasonable option for those with irreversible gut failure, hostile upper abdomen, and unsalvageable liver. Let us talk about portomesenteric vena thrombosis. These are the important clinical, endoscopic, and radiologic features that define the path of physiology and management strategy. Selective visceral angiograms are often helpful in identifying the extent of thrombosis and the pattern of the collateral flow. These images demonstrate a spared distal splenic vein on your right, recanalized SMV in the middle, and the few thrombosis with no visible collaterals on the left. Assessment of the liver volume with dedicated CT scan is also another important part of the decision-making process. These imaging studies show a reasonable liver size on the right and atrophic non cirrhotic liver on the left, which I commonly call a chicken liver. This interesting phenomenon is the result of long-term liver cell deprivation of the essential hepatotrophic factors. 
In these patients with extensive portal mesenteric vena thrombosis, elective endoscopic ablation should be deferred because of the coexistence of enteric varices. The futile attempts of TEPS should always be avoided, and portal hypertensive surgery be entertained and appropriately implemented. Here is a patent segment of the distal splenic vein that was successfully shunted to the left renal vein with impressive variceal decompression. This is another example of a large gastroesophageal collateral that was successfully shunted with an interposition jumpy graft to the renal vein that is still patent with 12 years of follow-up. I often call it a funky shunt. Extensive gastric defascularization without a splenectomy is also a valid option for patients with diffuse thrombosis who are not candidate for decompressive surgery. This slide illustrates an isolated liver transplant with cable portal and sometimes renal portal hemitransposition techniques as an option for liver failure patients with diffuse thrombosis to avoid the need for a multivisceral transplant. You can see here an excellent cable portal flow 20 years after liver transplant on the right side, but with persistent gastroesophageal collaterals and silent varices on the left. Multivisceral transplantation is obviously the ultimate solution for patients with diffuse portomesenteric vena thrombosis. However, it should only be offered to patients with parenchymal and or vascular decompensation. Thrombophilia is often the cause of portomesenteric vena thrombosis. Accordingly, I would like to highlight a few clinically relevant points. First, the transplanted liver does not correct most of the underlying causes of the hypercoagulability. Second, splenectomy should always be avoided in patients with JAK2 mutation and other myeloproliferative disorders. And finally, JAK2 mutation is a significant survivor risk factor after transplant as demonstrated in this article 14 years ago. What about retransplantation after the immunologic loss of liver-free allografts? The use of a multivisceral graft with domino liver transplant may be justifiable because of the immunoprotective effect of the concomitantly transplanted liver. Why not multivisera for everyone? As we all know, the intestine used to be called the forbidden organ because of its high alloimmunogenicity through different pathways as illustrated in this slide. Despite the three decades of experience, some of the gut transplant recipients continue to be at risk of destructive alloimmunity, particularly chronic rejection among the liver-free allografts. Graft versus host disease is also another life-threatening problem, especially in children and patients with splenectomy and immune deficiencies. Visceral complications can also be life-threatening in patients with composite visceral transplant. This is a case of pseudoaneurysm of the carol patch that is often difficult to manage. In summary, ladies and gentlemen, unless transplant tolerance is clinically achievable, the judicious use of multivisceral transplant is advisable. Portal hypertensive and autologous reconstructive surgery should always be considered in selected patients through an integrated multivisceral management approach. Thank you all.